Well, hello folks. Welcome to our Bible study, which we'll get into uh, here in a moment. Glad you're part of it. Um, hope you're having a good week. Better week than last week. And uh, surviving these cold temperatures in central Ohio. Uh, we've missed the sun for a few days. Uh, but it's, at least we're not in the, <coughs> buried by snow and ice right now at least. But uh, good to be together. Um, you might see I'm all ready for the start of hockey. Our beloved Columbus Blue Jackets are getting ready to start. <clears throat> College football just ended for the year. Sort of heartbreakingly for, for us Central Ohioans. But uh, next year is right around the corner. And sometimes you just run into a juggernaut, you know. So that happens. And not everybody in Central Ohio's a Cleveland football fan, but that's still going on amazingly. So maybe 2021 is going to be better than 2020. I thought I'd show you a couple things uh, before we get into our study, just in my office here, so you can get a better uh, <clears throat> idea of where I've been broadcasting from and maybe the strangeness, my strangeness. So I mentioned here my... my uh, Cleveland fandom. There is my quarterback, Bobblehead. Uh, does he move? I don't know if he moves. He moves a little bit. And you can also see some of the things kids have made me. There is my my uh, Marvel character, my favorite Marvel character. There's a pandemic puzzle that I did. Actually, two different ones. Uh, back earlier in the pandemic there is one of my Christmas presents that my daughter Maggie made for me um, and you can sort of see my my office is an eclectic mix of my interests some ancient some sports there's a piece of Mars Hill where Paul preached in Acts chapter 17 and some different things like that so I just thought you, I would show you a couple things to demonstrate my weirdness, I guess, more than anything. Hope you can see those. I don't know how well that video worked. But uh, <clears throat> we started, a, a, I guess, a three-session study last Wednesday night um, on uh, defining the word Christian, at least the way it's used in scripture and we're in part two of that tonight and so we will uh, break into that just here in a moment but uh, the study is sort of based tonight in the 26th chapter of the book of Acts so uh, that's where we'll begin in a moment let's pray for a moment to open our study God we ask your blessings on, on our study uh, that we will see things in your word that speaks to those things we need to to strengthen and things that will build us up and encourage us in the faith thank you for your love and your mercy thank you for your revelation your word help us to be faithful with it not only in understanding it but living it out and thank you for jesus our savior we pray in his name amen all right so there was a father who was teaching his son um, about what a Christian should be like. And, and he went through a list, quite a list of characteristics and, and beliefs and behaviors that he felt defined a Christian. And when the lesson was over, the father got a response that he, he never forgot from his son, the little boy ask after dad went through all the characteristics and beliefs and behaviors of a Christian he said dad have I ever met one of these Christians well um, hopefully he had and hopefully we do um, we're talking about this question really at, at, at its base what is a Christian and although that's a term that we use just universally um, when we describe people who believe in and follow Jesus, 
It's only a word that's used three times in the Bible. Other words are used much more frequently um, to describe what we're talking about, believers in and disciples of Jesus. So uh, what we're doing is just looking at each of these three places where, where the word occurs and what it has to say about this question of a Christian defined. So we started in Acts chapter 11, the first time the word is used. And in that chapter, Acts 11, verse 26, we're told by the writer Luke that it was in the city of Antioch, the ancient city of Antioch in the first century AD that the disciples were first called this, that they were called Christians first at Antioch. And then from that passage and looking at it a little more closely, we learned that the word Christian is not a title, it's a description and that there's an important difference in those two things. It describes a person who truly belongs to Jesus the Christ. We also noted from that text in Acts 11 that this naming of disciples as Christians showed that there was something different about them. Uh, there was something distinct about them that separated them from the Jews that they had normally been associated with before and other religious groups in the city. In other words, people saw this group and realized this is a different group. We have to call them something. And, uh, and, and so obviously the Christians were a known people. They were recognized. And, and thus they were eventually named. And the first time they were called Christians was in Antioch. The second time we find this word also occurs in the book of Acts, but it's more toward the end of the book in chapter 26. And we're going to find the second use of the name Christian um, and I think find, again, something very important about what a Christian is. So let's, uh, let's get to the setting of this passage first, because that will help us understand the words we read in a moment. We come to chapter 26 of Luke's second book called Acts. In the, the last approximately third of the book of Acts, we find the Apostle Paul, the great missionary of the church, He's, going, he's been arrested. He's going through a series of hearings and trials before various courts and rulers of the day. Um, and he's going through a process, process that took a few years, likely, that eventually lands him in Rome because he keeps appealing his case, in essence. And he will appeal uh, to the highest court in the world at the time. Now, we think of the high court as the Supreme Court of the United States, but in Paul's day, the highest court in the world was the court of Caesar in Rome. And so his case is appealed to that court, and he remains throughout this time in sort of a house arrest kind of situation. When we read in chapter 26 of Acts, Paul is called to a hearing before a governor of the area in which he's imprisoned. Uh, he's a Roman named Festus, so he's not yet before Caesar's uh, great court, but one of the lower officials. Uh, this guy's name is Festus, a Roman governor. And then there's also a Jewish ruler, or king, we might call him at the time, named Agrippa that appears in this story as well. So Festus was the one who had the, the real political power in that place. And he had found, as he heard the case, no valid charges made against Paul. And that's what kept happening in these, these trials and these hearings. They never really, uh, the charges never really added up to those who were hearing it. And that's what Festus discovered. Uh, so Festus invites King Agrippa, the Jewish ruler, to listen in. And Agrippa shows up like you might expect a king to, to show up. Great pomp and circumstance. Uh, he's surrounded by soldiers as he comes in, and he's got a pretty woman named Bernice on his arm. So you've got a Roman governor, this, this fellow Festus, and you have a Jewish king, 
King Agrippa. And before them stands this man chained up, this man named Paul. So you sort of have to imagine yourself in Paul's shoes. Uh, how would you respond in a setting like that uh, before a governor of Rome and a king of the Jews? Uh, would you feel, and you're chained up, you know, would you feel powerless? Would you perhaps cower uh, before these powerful men? What is a Christian like Paul supposed to do in a situation like this? Well, all I can tell you is what Paul did because it's recorded for us and, and how this turned out. And that's the, uh, you know, the essence of this, this passage in Acts 26. He begins Paul to speak as the chapter opens and he tells his story to King Agrippa and the august assembly that uh, is before him. And so he tells, tells him who he was, where he had come from, all, all the things he had done. He talks about how he had been a very zealous Jew. He was, uh, at one time, he says, a vigorous hater and persecutor of those who had uh, come to faith in Jesus. And we know that's what Paul was. He was a persecutor of the early church. And then Paul, as he tells his story, tells of his encounter with the risen Christ on the Damascus Road, how uh, Jesus had appeared to him, and, and, and uh, what we usually refer to as Paul's conversion story, and, and how after that appearance uh, he, be, he had become a disciple of this risen Jesus. And, and how could he not is sort of his argument, uh, because here before him suddenly was a man that he knew had been dead, who had been crucified in Jerusalem. And now he sees him alive and well and speaking to him and calling him, uh, calling him into his service. So that's where we're going to pick up. I sort of summarized a good chunk of the, the chapter there for us. But I want to pick up at verse 19 of chapter 26 and see how Paul finishes the speech that he makes to Agrippa and Festus and all the group that's assembled there in this hearing. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we can learn from it. So uh, again, Acts 26, we're going to begin at verse 19, read down about 10 verses. So again, this is jumping sort of in the middle of Paul's speech on this occasion. Verse 19, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both the small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first, to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And then it, Luke, the writer, <coughs> breaks in and, and he says this, And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, and this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, 
whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day, might become such as I am, except for these chains. Well, it's an amazing speech, and uh, back and forth there uh, at the end from Paul uh, to these great leaders, um, and, and really a lot of incredible things about those words, but I just want to underline one or two for a couple of minutes. The first thing that amazes me here, think about who is really in control in this room. And, and it's amazing, you know, who could doubt that it's this little uh, stoop-shouldered, unimpressive man with chains around his wrists? Who could doubt, after reading that, that, that it's Paul that's in control? And not the Roman governor, not the Jewish king, not the military personnel, but Paul. Uh, he's directing what's going on in this room. And it really should remind us of, of Paul's Lord, Jesus. Because if you go back and you read the story of, of Jesus' trials, when he was arrested the, the night before he was uh, crucified, at no time during that period was he ever out of control. Uh, at no time was he any less the Son of God. Uh, they, they may have been mocking him and, and uh, spitting upon him and beating him. They may even nail him upon a cross, but he's in charge all the way. Uh, in fact, he said, I lay my own life down. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down. He was in control. And it's the same with Paul on this occasion in Acts 26. They could have him in prison. Um, and, you know, they could throw him back in prison. They could release him back to the Jews. Uh, and we assume if they did that, he'd be executed just like they had executed Jesus. They really could do whatever they wanted to do with him in one sense. But Paul is in control of that room. Uh, he's the one that's asking all the important questions. He's the one speaking the truth. And he's the one in that room that's not afraid of anybody. Think in comparison of the other two political leaders there, Festus, the Roman uh, he's afraid the whole time. He's afraid of the whole situation. And it, again, reminds us of Jesus' trials, because you remember Pilate, the Roman governor, during Jesus' trial. His motivation totally is fear. Um, and, and it's the same with Festus. Festus is, is trying to keep the peace in his area. Uh, try to prevent riots and unrest among the Jews. That's what Pilate was concerned with. That's what Festus is concerned with. And then Agrippa, the, the Jewish king, so-called, was a politician through and through. And when Paul confronts him with that pointed question in verse 27, you know, Paul says, if you look there again, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And then he says, I know that you believe. He really puts Agrippa on the spot in that setting. I mean, can you imagine uh, somebody standing up and talking like that in the midst of the House of Representatives or the Senate, uh, where a lot of times religious language is, is frowned upon. But here's Paul doing it uh, in front of a Roman governor and a Jewish king. He really puts Agrippa on the spot. It's a question, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? It's a question that really should be responded to with a yes or a no, right? But Agrippa doesn't give a yes or no. In fact, he can't. He can't answer yes, I believe the prophets, at that moment, because the Roman, Festus, had just told Paul, you're crazy. Uh, and, and so... King Agrippa would be seen to be contradicting his Roman superior. He couldn't stand there and say, you're not crazy, Paul. I think just like you do. I believe the prophets. 
So he couldn't say yes, and he couldn't say no, I don't believe the prophets, because that would have enraged his main constituency, the Jewish people. So he's in a real pickle here, we might say. And uh, so we look at how Agrippa responds. He responds with a question. Paul, he says, would you persuade me to be a Christian in such a brief time? The older versions, like the, the King James, uh, say something like, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian? I think even a song has been written with those words. But likely the, the way to understand the language there is, is that uh, you know, Agrippa is not saying, Yeah, you almost got me, Paul. But he's most likely saying, in such a short time, you think you're going to persuade me to become a Christian? And so this is where we get the second use of this word Christian in the Bible. Agrippa uses it uh, as he is before Paul here. Um, because, you know, Agrippa knew what Paul's trying to do. Paul's trying to convert Agrippa and anyone else within earshot. Uh, He's trying to persuade them to faith in Jesus as the Christ. And in fact, if there's any doubt about that, Paul says so himself in the very next verse. He says, I wish all who hear me were just like me, except for these chains. So he's pointing out, yes, I'm a prisoner. I don't want you all chained up, but everything else that I am, I wish you would become, that is, a devoted follower and disciple of Jesus. So Paul in this situation is being an evangelist and Agrippa knew it and it made him uncomfortable. And so he responds the way he does. And so from this passage and this usage of the term Christian, I want us to, to see and understand part of being a Christian is being a bold persuader a bold persuader. So you've got Paul, this man in chains, but he really doesn't see himself as a prisoner, does he? Uh, he is, in fact, the most free man in that room. He doesn't feel limited in any way. He has the most powerful dynamite in that room. And it's the power of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now later, uh, Paul will write a letter to the Roman church, we know as the book of Romans. And in chapter 1, Paul would refer to that dynamite uh, when he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Uh, that's the dynamite. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And he's living those words out here in front of these supposedly powerful individuals. See, Paul had a message that he believed, and it was for Festus, the Gentile, and it was for Agrippa, the Jew, and everyone else that was there in that hall in that hearing and uh, it was good news of Jesus and so Paul very boldly tried to persuade them he stood before them he wasn't afraid uh, he controlled that room in essence and it didn't matter if if they listened or not that wasn't going to stop him uh, it didn't matter if they said things like you're crazy which they did it didn't matter if they responded with a sarcastic question, which they did. This Christian man, Paul, was a bold persuader in that situation. And that's part of what a Christ, being a Christian is. It's one thing we learn in this passage uh, from this use of the term. Uh, part of being a Christian is being a bold persuader. It's not all being a Christian is about, but it's part of it. And we're just commissioned by the Lord to boldly go, to plant gospel seeds as we have opportunity, and 
indeed to try to persuade people to believe in and obey Jesus and live for him. doesn't matter who they are. They might be very powerful people, if that's the audience God gives us. It might be people in the world who, who, you know, have power over us in some sense. Mighty officials, authorities, principalities and powers of the world, as the New Testament describes them. So it might be that situation, might be a relative we have, a mother, a father, a spouse, co-worker, a friend, whatever. Might be an employer. Who knows? Maybe it could be a congressman or a president or a policeman or a doctor, a coach or a teammate. If you're a Christian, part of what you're called to do is to boldly go and persuade as you're given opportunity. But to do that, you're really going to have to believe in the power of the gospel message. You're not, you're not going to be able to let fear prevent you. And when you're in situations like this, where it seems like all the power is on the other side, you're not going to be able to let that uh, cower or cause you to cower in that circumstance. Uh, fear is really a much stronger chain around our arms and legs than those iron ones that were around Paul. Uh, and that's something we have to confront in us. <coughs> a little story, there was a, a plant nursery one time, a plant nursery, and, and it had a sign out front that, that read this way. It said, the best time to plant a tree was 15 years ago. And then below that line, it said this, the second best time is today. And so when we think of the parallel in what we're discussing, the same is true. When we're talking about planting the seed of the gospel, as Jesus discusses in the parable of the sower and so forth. Um, when we think about planting the seed of the gospel in the hearts and lives of people, God has placed in our pathway the best time to plant was years ago, but the second best time is right now, right now. And so part of a Christian defined is being a bold persuader. Um, and there's never been a better time for a Christian to stand boldly, to break their chains, and confront their community, whatever, however we define that community, with the question, do you believe? That is part of what we are. And we learn that from Paul's example here. That, again, is the second time in the New Testament that we find the word Christian. The third time, we'll go outside of the book of Acts. We'll go to the letters of Peter and see the third occasion of this word again. A word we use constantly and, and consistently to describe believers in Jesus, Christian, only three times used in the Bible. And we'll look at the third and final time uh, next time. So, uh, again, good to spend a few minutes together. I see uh, several of you. I'm just looking to see. I can see little faces up in the screen. I don't know who the snowman is, but I'll figure that out later. But I see several of you, and there'll be more that will will tune in uh, at, at a later time. Glad to be able to spend a few minutes together. Glad we're moving, hopefully, steadily back toward a time when we can be together more face-to-face. -face. I will pray for that. But until then, we'll do our best with what we have. God bless you in your bold persuasion of others of Jesus Christ. See you soon.